Hello, and welcome to another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. The Midwest Rail Rangers, our 501c3 nonprofit organization, presents onboard educational programs across the upper Midwest. You may have caught us on the South Shoreline between Chicago and South Bend, Indiana, aboard the Sky Parlor car at the Wisconsin Great Northern, on an Amtrak charter organized by the 20th Century Railroad Club of Chicago, on private rail excursions featuring heritage equipment, and at various outreach events such as Train Fest and Mad City Rail. In March of 2020, the coronavirus sidelined most of our programs. To a halt as uh, train services, uh, bus services, interstate bus services, railways, metros, uh, they're all being stopped to break the march of the coronavirus. After taking a few months off, we decided to come back and present virtual programs, taking you to exciting rail destinations across Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. So until we can be together again back on the trains, sit back and relax and enjoy another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. join us here in beautiful Bayfield, Wisconsin. This is another one in a series of uh, virtual programs that the Midwest Rail Rangers are presenting for you in partnership uh, with our friends at the Wisconsin Great Northern Railroad and the 20th Century Railroad Club of Chicago. We're glad you could join us here in Bayfield for another one of our virtual programs. I uh, can't be with you on the train as we've been mentioning. Programs on the South Shore are kind of at a pause as well as the Wisconsin Great Northern Sky Parlor and our programs with the 20th Century Railroad Club on the Amtrak Charters, as well as our outreach events. I know Train Fest was canceled, um, and a lot of our private rail excursions pretty much for 2020. It's been, it's definitely been an interesting summer and an interesting uh, fall here. And uh, but we are doing our virtual programs. We got good feedback about the ones we've done so far, and glad we you could. Uh, you can tune in for another one of our virtual programs. Got my Hawaiian shirt on here. We're on the, not quite the Hawaiian shore down the, down the street here a couple blocks if you can see it. Uh, but I'm pretending, I'm pretending it's uh, Hawaii. I don't know. It's uh, pretty cold. I think it's December right now. But maybe we taped this a little bit ago. Anyway, we're here in Bayfield, Wisconsin. Uh, 375 miles north of Chicago about 300 miles north of Milwaukee for you folks uh, who live down, down, way down there. This is about one of the furthest northern spots you can go in the entire state of Wisconsin. It is also the furthest northern point on what's called the Great Omaha X. And we'll go into a little bit more detail here about what the Great Omaha X was. But it was essentially a railroad track that formed an X like this with Ashland and Bayfield on one side and uh, Duluth Superior Twin Ports on the other. And on the bottom two parts of the X's were Eau Claire and uh, the Twin Cities. And this was uh, built as a separate railroad. The Omaha route uh, got absorbed into the Northwestern. So we'll take you on a little journey back, uh, tell you a little bit more about the great Omaha X. And then we'll return to Bayfield and we'll tell you exactly and Candace will join us. Uh, she's boarding the boat down here without me. Uh, she's going to take you on a little cruise and show you what passengers did, some of them, when they got here to Bayfield at the furthest northern point on the Great Omaha X. So let's begin tonight with a look at the history of the Omaha X. The history of the various rail lines that would become 
part of the Great Omaha X, date back to around 1856, just eight years after Wisconsin became a state. It was in that year Congress voted to approve some land grants so a railroad line could be constructed between the capital city of Madison and the St. Croix River and shipping ports uh, up on Lake Superior. Trains were already operating in southeast Wisconsin at this point, with newly constructed rail lines pushing westward and northward across the state from the shores of Lake Michigan to Chicago, Milwaukee, and Green Bay. After a brief pause in development during the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, key events quickly followed. Between 1868 and 1872, the West Wisconsin Railroad built a 188-mile-long railroad line from Elroy to Hudson via Toma and Eau Claire. Trains began running on this line in 1872 from St. Paul, Minnesota, after a bridge was erected over the St. Croix River. At Elroy, the West Wisconsin Railway connected with the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. The CNNW was uh, in the process of extending this line from Madison to Winona, Minnesota. Now, around the same time, the North Wisconsin Railway began construction of its own railroad line. By the beginning of 1872, their tracks extended northward from North Junction, which is near Hudson, to around New Richmond. During the mid to late 1870s, the North Wisconsin Railway continued to extend their railroad line to the north. Crews constructed track between New Richmond and Big Marsh Lake, which is located near Richardson and Clayton today. Uh, this was done by 1874. They then reached Cumberland by 1876, Comstock by 1877, followed by Shell Lake in 1878. The following year, crews uh, built track up to Mud Lake, which is the, what uh, f future Spooner Lake would be called. A primitive settlement was established there called Chandler. Railroad commercial and residential structures were built here. Railroad crews were put on in Baronet and Shell Lake. In the spring of 1880, the North Wisconsin Railway was merged with several other railroads to form the new Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railroad, or the Omaha Road, uh, the track that had been built by the North Wisconsin uh, between North Hudson and Chandler became known as the North Division of the Omaha Railroad. Meanwhile, the layout for the village of Chandler was officially certified in 1880. It was located near a site that would, of course, eventually become Spooner, Wisconsin. The new town, uh, according to a Rice-like newspaper, was named for old Jake Chandler, who operated a popular trading post. Historical records indicate that there were more than one dozen saloons, two gambling houses, four stores, six hotels, two blacksmith shops, a shoemaker, a railroad roundhouse, a depot, and about 20 private residences. Uh, we were able to come across a May 12, 1880 timetable for the Omaha Road, featuring a uh, train departure from Chandler going south at 6 o'clock in the morning. Stops were Shell Lake, Granite Lake, uh, Cumberland, uh, Richardson Marsh Lake, uh, New Richmond, and it would finally get into St. Paul at 4 p.m., so it would take pretty much 10 hours to go from what is now Spooner to the Twin Cities. Uh, meanwhile, crews continued building the rail railroad line north of Chandler, reaching the town of Cable by the late, 18, uh, late 1880. The following year, in 1881, more and more communities began to show growth along the uh, Omaha Roads railroad line. The Shell Lake Lumber Company opened a massive sawmill that year, uh, which was a big boom for the town. The Omaha Road continued to expand its railroad lines in 1881. One crew was assigned to build tracks to the northeast in the direction of Bayfield, where we are this evening, out of Cable, completing four miles by the end of the year. Meanwhile, another crew worked on building a new branch line to the northwest in the direction of the twin ports, including Superior, um, from Superior Junction, which is now known as Trigo, Wisconsin, then completed nine miles of track by the end of 1881. Finally, uh, it should be noted that the Chippewa Falls and Northern Railroad began construction on a new railroad line also in 1881 from Chippewa Falls to Bloomer. The CF and N had no physical connection with the Omaha Road at the time and only uh, connection was with the Wisconsin Central at Chippewa Falls. 
following year in 1882, the ever-expanding Chicago Northwestern Railroad gained controlling interest in the Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railroad. Uh, despite this, the uh, CNNW kept the Omaha Road name for the train lines through Northwest Wisconsin. Operations were also kept separate from uh, the CNNW uh, until about the 1950s. So by the middle of 1882, the crew, crew building the Omaha Road trackage northwest from Chandler ended up reaching uh, Itasca Switch, which is near Superior, distance of uh, 52 miles. So they were definitely busy uh, during the year of 1882. The first through train from St. Paul to Superior via Chandler operated in November of that year. Expansion tour Bayfield was then prioritized with the Omaha Road crews reaching a point just beyond Mason, by the end of 1882, which was a distance of uh, 26 miles. The uh, year 1883 was extremely significant to passenger rail in northwest Wisconsin. As soon as the ground thawed, the Chippewa Falls and Northern Railroad laid its last five miles of track to near Hogan, completing the railroad line from Chippewa Falls to Chicago Junction. Almost immediately after, the Omaha Road purchased the line from the CFNN. Their crews also constructed about 11 miles of new track to connect to the east end of the line in Chippewa Falls with the Omaha Road main line in Eau Claire. Meanwhile, the Omaha Road crews continued to build their other railroad line from Hudson further north, reaching Ashland by July, and then finally Bayfield by uh, October of 1883. Eleven years of constructions and acquisitions in the Great Omaha X um, resulted in, in kind of what you see up on your screen. The Omaha Road now controlled important railroad lines spanning off in four different directions from the Chandler or would become Spooner areas. This included the Hudson Line, which ran southwest out to North Line Junction, which is near Hudson. The Altoona Line, which ran southeast to Eau Claire. The Ashland Line, which ran northeast to Ashland and Bayfield. And then the Itasca Line, which ran northwest to uh, Duluth and Superior. Uh, the Omaha Road decided to move its railroad operations from Chandler in 1883, even though the town was just four years old at the point. Uh, the area proved itself as an unsuitable location to continue railroad operations. According to newspaper reports from the era, one of the main issues with Chandler was that the water supply uh, had a lot of alkaline in it. This caused severe corrosion to the boilers of steam locomotives who had uh, frequently had to take on water. Apparently, a shortage of track space also existed at Chandler, preventing future expansion of the railroad yards. Other accounts also mention a forest fire that destroyed a portion of the town and a shortage of water that made future fire protection um, pretty hard. So the Omaha Road briefly looked at creating a new town um, near Chicago Junction. Uh, however, they're not able to secure enough land there. So um, workers moved to the north and created the town site of Spooner. It was named after... Um, Omaha Railroad attorney and future U.S. Senator John Coit Spooner. He played a critical role in the legal battles and proceedings that marked the development of the Omaha Road into northwest Wisconsin. If you do visit Spooner today, this is a Wisconsin State Historical Marker that you might find interesting. We'll go ahead and read it for you here. Development of the rail lines in this area was begun in 1871 from Hudson, Wisconsin by the North Wisconsin Railroad Company and completed by the Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railroad Company to Ashland, Superior, and Eau Claire by 1890. The Chicago Northwestern Rail Company acquired the Omaha in 1882, but did not operate the Omaha lines in this area in the name of the Chicago Northwestern until 1956. In 1882, the division headquarters were moved from Chandler, two miles north, and located here at Spooner, the center of this area, named after Senator John C. Spooner. A large passenger depot, freight depot, express office, restaurant, switching yards, roundhouse, locomotive, and car shops 
Lumber yards and division offices for the superintendent, train masters, dispatcher, master mechanic, roadmasters, and bridges and building supervisors were constructed. And all 600 persons, including the depot and freight agents, engineers, firemen, conductors, brakemen, switchmen, repairmen, baggagemen, expressmen, and office workers were employed here during the time. Every day, 18 passenger trains, 11 logging trains, and 10 freight trains Four section crews and 55 chain gang crews ran out of Spooner. Passenger service terminated here in 1961. Wood-burning engines were used from 1871 until 1885. Standard coal-burning hand-fired engines to 1912. Mikado heavier engines started to be used uh, in 1913. Uh, Stokers in 1930 and diesels in 1950. Spooner continues as an important railroad center of the Chicago Northwestern, handling tremendous tonnage. Its large payroll is a vital vital part of the area's economy. You can see the marker there was erected by the Spooner Kiwanis Club in 1975. So, um, unfortunately, this is now no longer part of the Chicago Northwestern, despite the historic. Uh, sign saying that it is. So we wanted to point out and kind of detail the uh, with this map up on your screen now of uh, what portions of the railroad line ended up being abandoned. The first uh, part to be abandoned was one of the branch lines of the Omaha X. So not the Omaha X itself, but the branch line. And you can see that in uh, in red there on your screen um, from Tuscobia through Radisson up in Sawyer County out to Park Falls. That was abandoned by the Chicago Northwestern uh, in 1965. The darker red up way up at the top of your screen uh, was the next stretch to be abandoned in 1977. And that was the first stretch of the actual Omaha X itself to face abandonment. And that was between Washburn and Bayfield, where we are tonight up here in Bayfield. Bayfield lost its uh, railroad service by the Chicago Northwestern in 1977. And then the abandonment two years later stretched south uh, along that line, the northeast branch of the Omaha X uh, in 1979 with uh, the tracks abandoned from Hayward uh, in Sawyer County across all the way up to Ashland Junction, Ashland, uh, and Washburn uh, in 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 uh, Bayfield County and Ashland County, um, and then the next stretch three years later to be abandoned was pretty much the uh, entire southwest leg of the Omaha X. Uh, was abandoned by the Northwestern from Chicago Junction, which is just south of Spooner, uh, over through uh, the northwest part of Barron County to Turtle Lake, uh, Clear Lake, and then down to Hudson. That stretch was abandoned by the Northwestern in 1982. Uh, then we faced about, uh, about um, 10 years of no actual change um, to the line. Uh, but the next abandonment uh, occurred in 1992 uh, from Rice Lake up to Tuscobia and to Chicago Junction. So part of that southeast branch of the Omaha X up into Spooner. Uh, and then the next uh, stretch of uh, abandonment, uh, you're able to see there as well. Um on your screen. So um, we're going to up, put up this other map here. And this kind of shows you what the Great Omaha X today, all the uh, red lines show what has been abandoned and is no longer, uh, no longer in use from the original Omaha X. So that includes pretty much the entire Southwest uh, stretch of the Great Omaha X from Spooner, Chicago Junction, Granite Lake, Comstock, New Richmond, and Hudson. That is completely gone, uh, as well as a little bit of a portion of the southeast branch from Spooner, Chicago Junction, Hogan, over to Rice Lake. 
uh, from Trigo to Gordon uh, through Washburn and Douglas counties. That's abandoned. And then from uh, just west of Hayward all the way through Hayward, Cable, Mason, Ashland, Ashland Junction, and Bayfield, that's abandoned. So everything you see there on your screen in red is now abandoned. The, the different colors there you see are, besides red, are portions that remain today. So we'll go through that real quick to, to show you um, the orange stretch between Rice Lake and Cameron is owned by Canadian National, and it's leased to the Wisconsin Northern Railroad, which is a, a freight carrier. From Cameron through Bloomer down to Chippewa Falls, that stretch is owned by the Union Pacific and is also leased to the Wisconsin Northern, a freight carrier that provides service. Uh, between Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls, that stretch is still owned by Union Pacific. Um, and, of course, the uh, Union Pacific was the successor to the Chicago and Northwestern, so that's why they own uh, that stretch. The Canadian National is a successor to the Wisconsin Central, which ended up buying that little stretch from Cameron to Rice Lake. So other parts that are... Um, that are still in use between Superior, you see the light blow on your screen from Superior to Gordon. Uh, that is um, owned by Canadian National. And when they bought the Wisconsin Central, they essentially had two parallel lines uh, from the Twin Ports into areas of Northwest Wisconsin. So they decided to keep the um, Omaha X portion of the route from Superior to Gordon and had a lot uh, fewer grades and was easier. And then they decided to switch over to the, uh, oh, is a Sioux line, uh, original Sioux line from Gordon to uh, Trigo. So only the portion from Superior to Gordon of the Omaha X is still in use. From Gordon to Trigo has been torn up. Uh, and then there's a little stretch of blue um, right on the Washburn. Uh, Sawyer County line but, uh, just southwest of Hayward that is owned by the Canadian National but is leased to the Wisconsin Great Northern Railroad. And um, Wisconsin Great Northern, of course, is one of our partners. We do our programs there. They do a lot of the bed and breakfast and elegant dinner trains, which we have uh, done segments on uh, back in July and August of this year, but they also have a, a, a small freight operation, short line freight operation as well. So there is a little stretch up near Hayward, Hayward Junction, that's still owned by Canadian National, but leased to the Wisconsin Great Northern. And then the the pink uh, through Washburn County, Trigo into Spooner, that stretch is owned by the state of Wisconsin and currently leased to the Wisconsin Great Northern Railroad. So looking at it, you can see the entire entire southwest part of the Omaha X is gone. Most of the line, the, no, uh, the northeast leg is gone, except from pretty much through a little bit of uh, Sawyer and Washburn counties and back into Spooner. Uh, the northwest is half gone, a little bit more than half gone, with Superior to Gordon still being there. And then a lot of the uh, southeast leg of the Green Home Omaha X uh, is still in existence um, from Rice Lake all the way down to Eau Claire, but abandoned from Rice Lake uh, up into Spooner. Well, we hope you had a better idea now of what exactly the former Chicago Northwestern, the great Omaha Railroad as well. Uh, hope you have a better idea now, a little bit more about that Omaha X, the Railroad X, up here in uh, northwest Wisconsin. But before we leave you, we've got another little part of the program that we're going to do for you. And uh, the question is, once tourists and everybody got up here to Bayfield, right on the shores of Lake Superior, what was there for? What was there to do? Why would people come up to Ashland or Bayfield? Well, maybe they had family up here. Maybe they had business up here. But during the summer season, a lot of tourists from Chicago would come up here to Bayfield. And one of the things to do was to take a cruise, a boat cruise, and see the beautiful and very scenic Apostle Islands. So with that part of our program, 
our education coordinator, Candace Tabern, is aboard the Archipelago boat right now, and she's going to take you out on a cruise and tell you a little bit more about all the different uh, Apostle Islands that passengers coming off the Great Omaha X could see after their train ride ended here in Bayfield. I yep. think I see her right up here. Hey, Candace. Thanks, Robert. We're aboard the Apostle Island Cruises and we're about to take you on a cruise of the islands and the National Park Service that you can visit while you're in Bayfield. Basswood Island has steep rocky shores forested with hardwoods about 50 years old. Off the northeast shore of the island, the picturesque standing rock called the Honeymoon Rock is shared by a couple of weather-beaten pines and a few resting seagulls. Hermit Island features scenic rocky cliffs that rise up from the shore on the northwest third of the island where the effects of easterly and northeasterly storms carve shelves and abrupt formations in the sandstone. The site of Frederick Prentice's Excelsior Quarry was located here during the late 1800s. Michigan Island. The island rises 90 feet above the lake. The south end of the island has a sand spit with a long picturesque beach. Michigan has two side-by-side -side lights at the southernmost point. Stockton Island. Popularity as the seasonal camping extends back as far as 3,000 years or more. Artifacts found from the early woodland Indians suggest that these early campers found this island as good as a camping site as present campers do today. Most recent visitors have spent time on the islands harvesting blueberries, fishing, and hunting. Yeah, we can't forget about Oak Island. That's also very popular. It's actually the tallest of the Apostle Islands. Did you know that, Candace? I did not. No, and it's often a landmark for boaters approaching Bayfield and Shuquamagon Bay area. Beaches can be found at Sand Point on the southwest corner of the island and near the northwest corner and also the southwest Sand Point. Hikers often take advantage of the 11 and a half miles of trails located here on Oak Island. Outer Island. At the south point, sand dunes from 10 to 40 feet above the water level extend up a mile on both sides of the island. A beach on the north end of the island from a rocky point to the lighthouse faces an amazing expanse of Lake Superior. Well, and then we have Manitou Island. One of several fish camps in the Apostle Islands is located here, which originated in the late 1800s, when the large fishery collection boats were stopping at the various Apostle Islands. The boats went to Sand, Bear, Manitou, and Madeline Islands on the same day. How about that? You can hit all four. At the present time, about a half dozen sheds and cabins remain here at the southwest corner of the island. Well, Ironwood Island. Mm, what a weird name. Is there iron and wood on there? It's forested with conivores and hard wood, but used to be forested with ironwood trees. Conifers. He said Carnivores. Lake Superior is 350 miles long, 160 miles wide. Ironwood Island. It is forested with conifers and hardwoods, but used to be forested with ironwood trees. Before being logged as late as the 1950s, logging and fishing shelters were located on the south point for use during the logging days of the 1950s and the fishing era before that. And then over at Cat Island, oh, it's about uh, three miles if you go north to south and uh, just over 1,300 acres. The island is completely reforested after being logged. Waved washed rocky ledges are found off the north end and a sand spit is found at the south end. A fish camp was located on the west side, heavily protected from winds and waves. 
Otter Island. Mm. Otter. Otter Island. Furry critters? Maybe. Otter Island is forested with hardwoods about 20 to 30 years of age. The most documented island history dates to June 1960 when 1,500 Boy Scouts and about 180 leaders came to the island on the Boy Scouts of America's Camboree. And then you have South Twin Island. Candace will tell you about North Twin Island here in just a second. But South Twin Island, that's about a mile long, three quarters of a mile wide. South Twin is the only island in the National Lakeshore that does not have rocky outcroppings as part of its shoreline. Did you know that? Along the west central shore of the island, the clearing with two buildings marks the site of the present ranger's residence and former fish camp buildings or private cabins. All right, so North Twin Island. Owning to its remoteness from the mainland and its small size, the island was not logged as the other islands were. This island is relatively undisturbed and is considered an example of the native boreal forest and hosts several species of rare vegetation. And then you have Rocky Island. Much of the shoreline on the southern part of the island is lined with the rocks, hence the name. Several buildings include private cabins and park service buildings that are on or are located along the shoreline. All right, well, this is the one where you'd probably live. Oh, yeah? Wonderful Husband Island? Devil's Island. Oh, what are you trying to say? Is the northernmost point of land in Wisconsin. Oh. Most notable about the island, other than its remoteness, are the sea caves which undercut the shoreline. In some places, the sandstone cliffs on the northern half of the island look honeycombed, sometimes even lacy, or on a grand scale. So you can ride to the furthest northern point on the Omaha X and then take a boat to the furthest northern point in the state of Wisconsin. There you go. Pretty cool. All right, well, we got Bear Island. Like I said that. Bear Island is the second tallest island, rising nearly 250 feet above the lake level. An old beach line can be found near the top of the island, evidence of a time when the lake level was more than 200 feet above its present level. So yes, Lake Superior is uh, slowly dwindling. And a time when the Bear and Oak Islands were the only islands above water. Well, this is one of my favorites, just because I love the, the fruit. Raspberry Island is the site of the second light station built among the islands. The first, the light first operated during the 1864 navigation season, was later included a double dwelling for keeper and families. And then we have York Island, a survey done by British Naval Lieutenant Henry W. Bayfield. Well, that sounds familiar. Bayfield, the end of the Great Omaha X. Lieutenant Bayfield in 1824 shows two islands called York and Rock. They were later joined by a sandbar, as they are today. And finally, we have Sand Island. In the early 1900s, Sand Island grew into a community which, with enough family living there year-round to support a school, a post office, and a cooperative store. At the north end of the island sits the lighthouse, which was lit in 1881. One of the most notorious shipwrecks of the Apostle Islands is located on the north, northeast of Sand Island. The Savona wrecked on September 2, 1905, and rests on the shoal in 20 feet of water. Of course, because there are lots of big trees out here. Additionally, though, it's because of the ease of transportation in here. The hardwood logs that they cut, the oak, maple, birch, these usually were loaded on the barge because they're large boats to be taken into the sun. Hardwood logs. Especially when they're fresh, they actually tend to sink relatively quickly. The sauces are a little bit different, though. 
the uh, the pine, fir, spruce. We need more common trees out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. To learn more about the Midwest Rail Rangers, our 501c3 nonprofit organization, simply log on to www.railrangers.org. That's www.railrangers.org. And if you're interested in planning your own trip, you can also purchase one of our Railroad Route Guide books, ebooks, or MP3 podcasts at the Midwest Rail Rangers store. Conveniently located at www.midwestrails.com. That's www.midwestrails.com. Until our next program, have a great day.